Okay, we're going to make a start now. It's about five past. Thanks everyone for that who's coming out. My notes to the um, ATA Melbourne EV group. So for this month, for those who are coming up in February, we are going out to the Macedon Ranges Sustainable Living Festival. So that's at uh, Wood End and that on this weekend. So we're going to be out on Saturday. I know there'll be a couple of cars coming from my group or Vetrex I'll be bringing up and there'll be a couple of other cars and that going there. And uh, we'll be talking uh, on Saturday from about 10 o'clock. And those are one of, the, one of the forums and that we'll be talking there. Rebecca will be talking also from um, Red Bikes and um, also Stuart Nesbitt from, from Moreland. I know so the three of us and those are going to be talking about electric vehicles. But anyway, that's coming up this Saturday up at Macedon. And of course, there's other things with the Sustainable Festival that'll be uh, well worth going up and that and seeing. So is there any other news coming from the group? Any other events that you know on or any projects that are going on at the moment? With the car that I've been working on, the Capri, on those, it's running now. I've finally got it going. So we installed the batteries and uh, worked out some of the electrical problems, got it all going. So uh, I'm going to get some body work done on it and uh, then get it registered on those, you know, for roadworthy for registration. And those, it was registered in New South Wales and it's got a uh, engineering certificate. So hopefully it should go through, the rego should go through here once um, I've got a roadworthy for it. So that's coming along. So uh, tonight we were just going to talk about, we're going to do a bit on autonomous cars. There we go, slideshow. So the next thing that's coming through in vehicles, and that autonomous cars. On the right here, you can see we've got Google Car. On those, that's um, been going around for a few years now. Google have been testing that for two or three years. And on the left there, a lot of research going on in Europe as well, with that's Audi and Mercedes and Volvo, all the car companies and that are really into it on those and trying to see what will be coming next with autonomous cars just developing the technology and that is necessary for it. So what's currently available on those, some of the technologies have been released on those. We don't have fully autonomous cars on the, on the road, but this is some of the technologies that are available. Adaptive cruise control. So obviously cruise control, which will slow down and speed up with the vehicles in front on those, you know, has a front, front radar system on those, so it knows how far away it is. So that's another driver's assist. Automatic parking on those, as we see on, on TV, on those on the ads, so all, all the cars now are starting to come out with automatic parking. Automotive nav navigation system. We've had that for quite a few years, you know, like a GPS and that within the car. And that's, so that's electronic so you can navigate. Blind spot monitoring on those has been fitted onto some of the cars. For people who won't look on the left-hand side, on those they just don't look and those, well, that can be covered with a sensor and that there so you don't come too close to a car on the left. Collision avoidance system in those as well. So um, measuring what objects are around the car to avoid a collision, whether it's in front or whether it's coming in from the side. Crosswind stabilization. This is one that I haven't heard of so much. It was mentioned in, um, in one, of the, uh, one of the sites that I was looking through. On those, so it's enough. Must be another automatic system of stabilising the car during crosswinds. Forward collision braking, and those so we see that quite often, and they've been advertising with the cars on those with sensing from the front for collision. Hill descent control is another one that I haven't seen so much. It must be still becoming available in the cars. Lane following system and lane change assistance. They quite often go together. I know it's something that we've seen that's been introduced into the Teslas and then into some of the uh, luxury cars, that uh, European cars that are available. Pedestrian protection system. 
they're now starting to put these into cars whereby uh, it's like an airbag, but on the front of the car. Instead of being inside the car, it's now on the front of the car to protect a pedestrian who might hit the, hit the front of the car. Traffic sign recognition. The uh, Tesla Model S has that as well, being able to recognize traffic signs and often uses a camera or a video system on those and uh, be able to pick up signs that are on the side of the road and software to recognize them. And vehicle communication systems. At the moment, what we're seeing with those is mainly things like software updates on those, whereas the car has got a communication system built in that it can communicate. Like with a Tesla, you can get software updates. But in the future, on those with autonomous cars, that's going to become quite important. Now we're looking at the technologies that are needed for an autonomous car. I'll explain some of these in detail a bit further on, so I'm just going to give an overview at the moment. The ultrasonic sensors, of course, so ultrasonic sensors on the side of the cars that can tell if there's an object approaching the car, how far away it is. It's not an ultrasonic sensor can't tell you what the object is, but only how far away it is and um, can't even tell you what direction it is. They only, uh, they'll have a range and they'll work in a certain direction, but it won't know if it's to the left or to the right. Video cameras. Video cameras are then quite often on the front of the car and sometimes on the rear. So a video camera can give you a, give a, the car a lot more information. It can um, work, as I say, recognizing signs and that on the road. It can uh, see objects in the foreground and work out where they are in relation to the car, whether they're straight in front or off to the side. So it gives a lot more information. The uh, laser radar or called LIDAR on those this is the main technology that's being used with autonomous cars. The LiDAR systems on those is a radar system using a laser, which scans around and it'll give a 360 degree vision around the car and able to recognize objects there that the car can then compute where they are and what the objects are. Precision GPS, they're now starting to introduce GPS systems that have an accuracy of five, two, or even one centimeter on those, so improving the, um, the GPS system. So the car will know where it is on the road, how far it is from the gutter, and um, all the things, all the stationary things that are around it that would be on GPS on those coming through. And then to make it all work, we need artificial intelligence on those. So that's the computer systems that would go within the car that's able to interpret all this information and uh, make decisions as to which way to go with the stop, um, you know, decisions for the vehicle. And then the last system, vehicle communication systems. We're now looking at systems whereby um, the cars will actually communicate with each other. So with vehicle communication, one car can tell another car where it is and what it's doing on those. So um, the communication systems will advance whereby the cars can communicate with each other. One car could even tell another car, I want to go ahead, and the other car could slow down, or that I'm coming through on those and where they may be going. So the communication systems will become more important. The first one, ultrasonics and camera. Um, this is typically what's fitted onto a Tesla Model S, but also some of the other European luxury cars. On those, the the yellow symbol into indicates ultrasonics, and ultrasonics work very well at short distances. You know, they're able to work up to five or 10 meters away on those and just give a general scan around the area as to are there any objects nearby at the side or in front on those. Um, so the ultrasonics is used more for close, close up. Whereas the camera, the camera gives a bit more view that one's a front-mounted camera. You could have cameras on the sides if you want in the rear, but front-mounted camera is the most common on those. So that will then give vision ahead as to where vehicles and any, uh, any things on the road and that that might be there. Also able to see at the side, side a bit if anything's approaching from the side. And you have the camera systems. Now the next system was the, the light, LiDAR system on those using a laser, the laser can scan 360 degrees and show where items are where 
it can give a three, three dimen uh, two dimensional, like 360 degree map around the car of what's there. So the Google car uses a LiDAR system and uh, they've been commercially available for several years. They're using them on um, things like tractors and uh, other things that need to be able to use laser imaging on those to tell where they are. are those, but they're also adaptable for a car. There's the laser imaging system. Just released in January this year, Navita have released a computer which is uh, designed for use in an autonomous car and in vehicles. Uh, it's a very powerful computer. Most of the computers we've had these days, you know, a four or eight core. This has a 12 core processor. It can uh, handle, it was in the terabytes per second, the number of instructions that the computer can do. This computer is designed for car use. It's actually water cooled on those. So it's designed to be work in a vehicle environment and be reliable on those with water cooling. And those, so they're also going along with the sensors and well, as well as the computers, which enable it all to work. Because um, we need the artificial intelligence. We need the car to be able to tell what's required of it on those that, with the information coming from the sensors. It is, yeah, they do graphics cards and uh, other you know, high performance computer equipment. Yeah, it's the same company. So they've released an automotive computer. Well, this is not their first one. They've released them before as well. So with all those systems and as they come together, I've just got a bit of video here just to show what they can do. On those, this is um, video from the Google car. So the computer is scanning objects around it, working out what, what they are, what direction they're going. It's a little bit of a video just to show as to what it does. segmented in detail. It's a very modern data set. So we took that same network we used for the kidney data set and pulled in this data and retrained. And because we can retrain so fast, we're able to iterate very quickly. So that in the tweaking to the algorithms and how we set up the neural network, exactly how we train to get these types of results. So we trained for five different classes here. So pedestrians, street lights. Now one engineer coded something to detect a man walking across the street in a suit. That's right. It's as you were he's walking down the street. Not one feature detector was coded by him. Correct. We, it's basically like only a million million of flashcards to the computer and tell you to learn. And basically, you have to get the right direction when this thing's wrong. So it's like you have to be able to have a trade in the types. Very, very quickly. But as I said, because we're not having three hundred engineers that are handling features, we can turn around experiments so fast. Basically, you're now using compute time, which is relatively cheap compared to engineering time in order to use experiment. Quickly, you can turn things around. So in this particular case, not only are you detecting a car, you're detecting all of the pixels that are associated with a car. Right. So where this gets important is you think about needing to calculate free space you can see. So it's sort of like you ask a child to take a crayon and say, hello, 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 cars. And so this gives you much more perception saying, well, you know, what can I drive on? What is this thing at this pixel that I'm looking at? So it's a much more robust way to handle perception in a car. The practical solution is you're going to combine all these techniques. And this is, this is still the same point ever. We taught it to recognize one thing, and then we taught it to recognize more than one thing, and then now we're, we're teaching it to recognize which pixel associates with what thing. That's right, so it's So what the software has to do within the um, computer programs, of course, is to recognize objects around them. On those, they have to, um, the artificial intelligence of the computer has to learn what a car looks like, what a person looks like, what a bike going a cast, you know, all the different objects is what they are and then try and recognize what they are. As well as knowing the proximity of where they are and that within the, within the sphere, they're also looking at the artificial intelligence of the computer to actually know what the objects in that are. 
No? Why not? Okay. <laughs> we would have to then train a chair. What's the left and what's the right side of the road? Maybe you say American software. No, it wouldn't work in Australia, would it? Or maybe even the European one. <laughs> It'll try and drive down the wrong side of the road. <laughs> and then we've got legislation on those. So for the self-drive cars to be released on those, they have to be work out with legislation as to how they're going to be, um, well, all the legal requirements on it. At the moment, we have uh, four states of the US on those that have passed legislation to allow drives, driverless cars on the road. And three countries in Europe, as you see, uh, have legislation there regarding testing on those so that they could test them on the road. But at the moment, the technology is not really known. Um, no, that last line there is incorrect. It's from another one, from another presentation. <laughs> Now, the last line should say that um, the legislation won't be developed until the legislation won't be developed until the actual technology is known. So they can't really write the legislation now until um, they actually know what the technology is and what the. So we really have to advance a bit further the technology before they can that they could do that. Uh, and when I was doing my research, this one came up, which is another interesting idea. Um, Formula E is looking at having an autonomous race that they call Robo Race. So we may have racing cars going around the going around the tracks on those with no drivers in them. Maybe they could put a dummy in the front or something. I don't know, and that sits in the car, but <laughs> there won't be someone driving it as such. But they're quite serious about this on those, and they're looking they're looking for teams that are willing to come in. It'll be a like a novelty race, it'll be before the main race starts on those, and they want um, teams that will actually develop these driverless cars. Um, the technology is already there. The company called Kinetech on those uh, says they have mature technology which they can put into these cars. So uh, yeah, they're just looking at um, letting, uh, having teams that would actually start on those and do the robo race. And the last thing here, I had a video that I was going to show you of what could be, what could be happening with driverless cars. This one is from um, General Motors. General Motors has also developed a um, autonomous vehicle, and those, and this is a prototype that they were showing at a um, at a motor show in Detroit last year. Those, but um, quite interesting to see what what some of the possibilities are with driverless cars. Hmm. So some of the things like that was shown within that um, clip on those, I talked about the vehicle communication system, like actually having cars that are working peer-to-peer, -peer, which are uh, communicating with each other. And you can see how that could be important on those, like for the cl collision avoidance. The cars could be, when we had the cars coming up to the intersection, they could be telling each other, which car is going to go first? Where am I? Am I going to try and try and go through that gap? Whatever. So collision avoidance system, but with communication between the cars, um, well, then they know if another car is going to come up and collide into it as well. It makes the whole network a lot better. And the same with the, the ambulance that came through on those. If the ambulance had uh, networking in it or on those, it was telling the other vehicles, I'm an ambulance and I'm coming through. And then the vehicles can then move away automatically out of it. So one thing that probably hasn't been talked about so much, but the actual networking, like having a cloud whereby all the vehicles are communicating with each other on those, I think is probably another important part of it, as well as what we see these days, like of the sensors to avoid hitting a pedestrian or knowing what's ahead of you in front of you, you know, like the other sensors and that that are on the car. Yeah, so there's quite a few technologies and that will go into. Um, some of the autonomous cars and I suppose we look at a car now these days we see a four-door sedan you know and the basic cars that we we have these days um, and they could be made autonomous but some of the newer cars that will come out on those that'd be quite interesting like for instance you'd be able to um, 
if instead of ringing for a taxi, uh, you'd ring for a car to come to your house on those, and it may be one of the little two-seaters or something, or it could be, you know, another sort of car. So um, car sharing could become more common on those, and especially in the city areas, because autonomous vehicle would be able to come without a driver, and then you'd be able to book it for a certain time and then it would come in there to it. But also other things, there are other things that would, um, you know, other different changes that will come with autonomous vehicles. So um, did anyone have any questions on those? Did you want to ask any questions on it? There may be some I may be able to answer. Yes. One of the things that's... Yes, yes, you won't hear it through okay. the speakers, but... Uh, One of the things that strikes me is that that technology now allows cars to drive closer together and there's no reason why the car can't drive 10 centimeters behind the car in front and therefore you double the amount of cars you get through on a road so we don't need to upgrade any of our roads for the next 20 years and the cost i mean it's eight billion dollars to build the east-west tunnel if all that money went into converting the cars to be able to do that you wouldn't need the tunnel anymore Yes, that's true, isn't it? On those, the cars will be able to drive much closer together without having collisions on those because the autonomous car will be far better at, um, you know, at uh, maintaining safety than, than what we are in those. So, yes, you see the advantages in that that would come in through there, and that is enormous. Also, in that video, I noticed that uh, they had called it platooning. There were several cars driving together, you might notice, and I suppose that, that also reinforces what you said too. But um, also the cars would be able to drive in a group. If you've got, if you're also going to the same, same destination, you could have several cars driving together on those and just operating like close together. Or if you're um, booking a hire car and you had six people that wanted to go, well then maybe you need three cars, three of the small cars and that to do it on those so that they can operate together. So um, any other questions? Yes. So, Paul, on that, it seems, I mean, you say safety, like from the algorithms or from the IT side of things, but the physics of the cars and sizes, I mean, one of the things nowadays is you've got four-wheel drive and you've got smaller cars and the general public perception of having a, a heavy car and a light car, obviously all these things are going to have to be subject to regulation and various things. It'll be interesting to see how that unfolds because, I mean, whilst you're going to have all the safety, people are still going to have it in their minds, you know, in a big car, I'm going to be safe, and a truck and a small car, I'm not. And then, um, yeah, it just, I don't know if you've got any thoughts around some of that. Uh, yes, I suppose as the technology matures on those, we'll see the legislation come up. You know, how is it going to be safe? What safety requirements are there on those? How are autonomous cars going to operate with non-autonomous cars, you know, like the two together on the road? Uh, with that sort of thing and that to see. So it'll be interesting to see what comes through, like the legislation for that. Um, with the Google cars, for instance, the, uh, the Google cars, they've done 1 million kilometers now so far in the Google self-drive cars. I think they've got a fleet of 12 of them and they've been going for about three years. So it's actually 1 million miles. So that's um, 1.6 million kilometers. And the cars had been involved in 12 accidents on those. Um, eight of the cars were run into at the back at a stop sign or a traffic light. So a car behind them and had rear-ended them, which is probably, you couldn't avoid that, couldn't you, in a self-drive car. Uh, two of them had been sideswiped by a car coming, changing lanes and, and running into the side of it. Uh, there was one, one car that was involved in an accident where someone ran a stop sign and, and ran into the car. So you'd actually hope that the car could avoid that on those, you know, an autonomous car may be able to avoid that sort of accident. But there was one where uh, someone ran a stop sign. And also um, in the Google self-drive cars, there was one accident where an employee had an accident, he was driving it manually. So it wasn't on auto. <laughs> and uh, they had an accident on those, yeah, a minor accident on those by the drivers. So, um, so far they've got a pretty good safety record. But in talking with this presentation on those, actually I've been talking to a few people that I know, I've been telling them that I've been doing, doing this presentation. And I'm surprised that like the general attitude amongst the public is they're quite suspicious of self-drive cars as to whether they're actually going to be safe. 
And, uh, you know, oh, no, I can't see how a self-drive car could drive as well as I could. And, you know, there are concerns about safety and that too. So I think it'll take time, you know, for public perception to, to see that these cars can be safe and are probably safer than what they're driving now, on, you know, with their own driving skills. Uh, Paul, with what we've just discussed with uh, the Google cars having 12 accidents, how are they going to legislate autonomous vehicles on the road with drivers that are not going to give up their cars? Well, I suppose like everything in our life, I think there'll be a choice, won't you? You know, you'll have the choice of whether you would have an autonomous car and trust it or whether you would drive a, a standard type car. And I suppose it'll be, a, you know, it'll take a, be a time of change. And sometimes the public will follow behind the technology, isn't it? Which is a bit of a problem. <laughs> so is that what you mean or did you well, say something else? Well, yeah, I, I did mean that, but that's not going to solve. Um, I mean, one of the reasons for autonomous vehicles is, A, they can brake quicker, um, the, or, the, or the technology and avoidance. But if you've got humans behind steering wheels that are texting and going through stop signs and not looking in their mirrors, what's the point? You're going to get hit. That doesn't make an autonomous car any safer. No, so really well. Quite like from another car, I think, well, yeah, exactly. what you're meaning, from, yes. From a, a driver, a human driving a car. Mm -hmm. So to legislate, I mean, that's going to be a pretty tall order for a government to say no one's allowed to drive unless you're in an autonomous vehicle to be completely safe. Very true. And I, I don't know if that sort of legislation would come where they say that no one can drive in a car that, without it being autonomous on those, but probably when we talk about legislation at the moment, we just, the actual legislation of when these autonomous cars come onto the road, uh, the legislation regarding um, what requirements are they, you know, how, what standard do the manufacturers have to make them, you know, for them to be acceptable on the roads, and um, what's going to happen with accidents, you know, if an accident does occur, is it the uh, manufacturer of the car that's responsible? on those because it's autonomous, you know, it's not a driver that's driving it, you know, so there'll be complications regarding accidents and um, liability on those with an autonomous vehicle that have to be worked out. So, so you both touched on the point, like Mario, like I guess what the example I was saying before was that, you know, we know that, for instance, people drive four-wheel drives when they don't actually need to use four-wheel drives, but they drive for a safety aspect, and yet there's no, there's been no um, legislation that says, look, you have to drive in a smaller car because you don't really need to, and because everyone drives bigger cars, everyone drives bigger cars because of safety. So it sort of goes the chicken and egg situation in terms of logically what you do is so logically, you know, you, you use smaller cars and everyone does it, but the perception, you know, particularly, let's say people with family conscious, they don't want to get in an accident. So I, that's the difficulty I see. Like you can have all this technology going through, but then the legislation where people have input into it and it's, as you just said before, you know, I can drive better than the machine. I can relate to a mining experience years ago when I worked in the mining case, we went through PLC and we said we can drive this machine better, more productive with PLCs and various things. Or the mining company says we want to put a bigger horsepower on the front. They just won't. And we, we, we conclusively showed that with the PLC and algorithms and software, we were getting 20% extra extra production. But they go, we just want more horsepower. And that's right. the sort of mentality I'm talking about. It's hard in the political environment where people are pushing for it and politicians are responding to that and legislation. So that was just a general comment statement. I mean, it's going to be hard to know either way. Yeah, I think I agree with you. You know, the public perception of cars and that is very important on those who are. A house is probably our, our most, our largest purchase that we make. And then our car is our next largest purchase. And uh, people really identify with their cars and, uh, and what they mean to them. So the perception around purchasing of cars and what people want in a car, you know, is, is something that's very important in society. So, uh, yeah, these are issues that you'll come up against. And uh, we do even with our... Um, you know, with driving small cars or uh, fuel efficient cars or whatever, people, um, some people in society just don't want them, you know, they don't, they don't believe that's the, that's the way to go. On those, they say, yes, you say they want their four wheel drive or their SUV on those that they prefer to drive on those, even though it's a heavier and probably less efficient type vehicle. Um, so, but uh, I think uh, public will always, the public will always be like that. 
is what I'm saying. It's about oh, okay. safety. So all those other things you talk about, the practicalities and, and functions of cars and choices and commercial choices or other things. But I'm You're talking, about, like, safety. No, I'm talking about the actual safety and legislating around safety because it's a perception of what is safe and not safe, how is safe, how do you tell someone that they're safe or not safe, you know, and that's, that's going to be a very tricky one, no doubt. Okay. Well, I, I suppose it's what people, what people will perceive what they perceive, but an autonomous vehicle would be safer than a, um, a car that you drive yourself, even within an accident, like if, if a collision is about to occur on those, the autonomous car would be able to react uh, faster and more accurately than what the person driving the car and that would. So um, there, it is safer there in that way, even with when you've got cars coming towards you which aren't autonomous or you know, are about uh, causing an accident. Um, so the, they are safer and as such, Diego. And then people may perceive that or they may and not. I, and I totally agree because I mean in, in, in an environment like this and you know you can show all the, all the science around it and technically that it is, but what I'm saying in a political environment where the legislature is involved, if, so, if 90% of people say I don't feel safe even though it can be shown to the contrary and various things, they still have to respond to that it, it, it's the difference between the illusion so we, we might say it's safe or it is safer and it can be shown and demonstrated safer but if the person and the vast populace says we don't feel safe with it it's very hard for legislators then to implement something if there's a big outcry on those things even though it's to the contrary so i'm saying it, it's, it's okay. a case between a rational and an irrational type of thing but often these things can be based on an irrational basis mm. uh, because of that's what that's what the perception is whether that's reality or not doesn't matter it's the perception that people portray and they do that i'm just like my point being before like they haven't actually legislated against four drives not being on the road because people feel it's safer and they do that none of the legislators been say take the four drives off and use it so in this case where that hasn't been able to occur this is the next level of that where you now got cars that are driverless people you know 90 percent of the public says it's not safe and it can be demonstrated 10% safe, it's still going to be hard to then go across the line and legislate it when, you know, 90% of people are against it. Yes, I suppose that's true, isn't it, on those? So um, it's probably up to the industry then to educate society and try and get that, that change on those. And so it'll be a slow process on those. That slows the process down, I suppose, so um, industry can then train them about it. But the legislation also is really just to allow the autonomous vehicles on the road. It doesn't mean that, that people have to drive them on those. People still have a choice of what type of vehicle and that they want to drive. And we hope that that would stay in the future, you know, rather than saying, well, this is the vehicle, you're not allowed that. Um, people will still have a choice. When I'm talking about legislation, it is really um, legislation that will enable these new technology, new vehicles to be legal on the road and to, uh, to be allowed. So, and of course, the liability as to um, what happens if there is an accident on those, that liability has to be worked out as well. And then as the technology changes and improves on those, well, then the legislation will probably follow the technology as well on those, because if these cars are proven to be safe, um, then there's a basis there for writing legislation for them. Um, so yeah, it's quite a complex area, isn't it? And I think it'll just progress slowly. Uh, along as the technology um, matures. But what's likely to happen is that as they come out and they're proved to be more safe, insurance on them will drop and things like that, so people will get a financial reason for doing it. Okay. But you're also likely to get to the stage where there'll be particular roads where you can only drive an autonomous vehicle. And that would make sense that you design it for autonomous vehicles. If you haven't got an autonomous vehicle, you take the slow other route. Yes, so that maybe that's the case. Evolve you'll get lanes on freeways which you can only have autonomous vehicles on. So it'll go that way. It is, isn't it? Yeah, when we look at it, it's a to totally different concept of a vehicle to what we have in, at the moment. So all these um, possibilities are there on those and those and as to what can be done and um, how they decide to implement them and that and use them. I suppose going on from the concept of uh, roads, specific roads or lanes that can only be used by autonomous vehicles in the context that an autonomous vehicle can more accurately keep its lane or more, more accurately navigate other traffic. You can visit situations where the roads themselves are either narrower or single lane roads could be used in multiple directions or two lane roads could be used with actually two lanes going one direction and one the other as long as 
the central area is vacated if you have a car coming the other way and they move around each other. Situations like that where you no longer need so much uh, width of the roads in order to allow um, more traffic through. Mm. Yes, I suppose the sensors and that will enable the cars to travel a lot closer together and in smaller lanes. But as I said, the networking and the communication so is very important too if that technology matures on those and then the actual cars will um, know what other cars are on the road, you know, what's coming towards them and they'll be able to communicate and work together uh, and that with them. That was like the collision avoidance that uh, where they had the intersection, you know, we had cars crossing over it randomly on those, we looked randomly, but they probably knew where they were going um, and then not requiring traffic lights. So, but I, I think that, when looking at that, that would be in the, the long distance future, isn't it? Yeah, because obviously non-autonomous cars wouldn't be able to cope with that situation. <laughs> Potentially, you could find situations where there are still traffic lights, where there are still traffic lights, but only for the human drivers. If you're an autonomous car, all the traffic lights go red and all the autonomous cars go through you have to wait for them. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> On those in the autonomous car, if it finds a gap, it may go through it. And um, if it, yes, exactly. And if, it, if it's safe and it knows it can do it, it may be able to. <laughs> okay, are there any other questions? Yes. Paul, I believe the uh, Google car is real. Do you know how real the GM car is? Beg your pardon? The, Do you know how real the GM car is? How real it is? Uh, it was a prototype that was designed by General Motors and, and Segway. So uh, they were involved with some of the self-balancing systems. There was a couple of them that were built in Japan. They used a couple of the Japanese um, cars as, as the actual basis for it. So you might notice that car where the, the front opens on those, that's also been built in a non-autonomous version. So uh, how real is it? It's, it's a prototype. It's not a, a car that will be ready available, though it is a car that is operating on that on the road. But as we see this technology is developing and um, you can have a car, you can build a prototype and then in two years time on those, well that prototype is just uh, obsolete on those because this technology is developing at uh, quite a rapid rate. I, um, a couple of questions. Uh, one goes back to the um, the four states in the US, which have um, um, which have basically legalised autonomous cars. Um, has that had? Uh, and, and you talked about insurance earlier. Has that um, sort of changed uh, the insurance company's attitude to um, to these cars, or or, uh, or at this stage, is there only research vehicles that are on the road, and and therefore none of these are private, so it becomes an issue for the manufacturer only, and not for individuals at the moment. Okay, well, that first question, uh, yes, it is only research vehicles that are available at this stage on those, no autonomous cars and that have been released. Some of the early systems that I showed you before, like um, the, the advanced systems that, um, you know, like collision avoidance, lane following systems and that, that have been released on cars, on those, um, the driver at the moment is still responsible uh, for any accidents and that that occur. On those, they're actually only driver assistance type technologies. But uh, no, they haven't come across that, um, that block yet where they, it's when they actually release cars that are available to the public um, that all this has to be put in place. Uh, also, with the um, the autonomous cars, is, is it um, in your research? Is there any proposal and um, to actually have a, a manual control of the vehicle, or is it always or always going to be autonomous? Um, both types have been seen in research on those. For instance, like the Google car on those, which has manual control as well as autonomous on those. So um, I think both types of cars are being looked at, and those. Um, the, the, the fully autonomous vehicle would be the most likely result that would come out of, out of the research at this stage. So they are looking at cars which actually don't have a steering wheel on those or, you know, or driver input that are fully autonomous. Hmm. Like when they're, they're driverless, but in that research, do they still need to have the driver in the driver's position? or are they actually not in the driver's position? 
Well, they're not in the driver's position because there is no driver. So um, the autonomous car... Does there need to be a contingency in the legislation that they have to have one there in the event that somebody... Well, let's see. The legislation hasn't... Um, no, no. Yeah. Well, for actual for trials at this stage, or the legislation that is for so that they can trial autonomous cars, yes, they do have to have a driver in the driver's position. So, yes, that's true. The current legislation does require a driver. I believe with the um, Google autonomous cars, when they're in autonomous mode, you, you can't autonomous, you can't manually drive it. There's no steering wheel. No, because there is no driver's seat compared to passenger's seat. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're in manual mode. Yeah. <laughs> Just one other thing that this all uh, raises is the problem of hacking. If you've got all these cars talking to each other and someone's fibbing, you're in lots of trouble. Yes, yes, that's very true, isn't it? And I suppose that's where the artificial intelligence has to come in on that within the car. Like um, when we talk about autonomous cars, autonomous means a car that's able to make decisions on its own on those so that it can actually make uh, decide. So it's not an auto automatic car, it's actually an autonomous car. It has to have artificial intelligence built within the car. So the car has to be able to make decisions um, for itself. So if it was receiving wrong information on that from another car, on those, and maybe its senses, its senses indicated that there was going to be a collision, uh, the computer should be able to make the decision to, you know, to interact, to move away or to, to uh, work the car that way. So, uh, yeah, so that's the basis of the start. They do call them autonomous cars on those, and the artificial intelligence and the technology, uh, the computer technology is an important part of it. Uh, I guess for myself, as someone who's uh, becoming increasingly uh, conscious about my privacy online and my uh, security of, of my personal information and, and data and stuff that's now you know being stored and uh, becoming vulnerable. Um, I find it really interesting, the cloud-based system for uh, vehicle interactions and control, um, especially in the last few years, it's been proven several times that cloud systems are not inherently secure uh, mm -hmm. and they've been breached and, and things have been released and all sorts of stuff's happened, especially like a closed source system where uh, you know, no one's allowed to see how the programs are written or uh, no one can verify that they are secure. Um, so I, I personally find that very interesting and that'd be a very interesting uh, bridge to cross when they start to, if they start to do that sort of thing. Yes, I suppose I, that's I'd true, feel, isn't it? From just the person I am, I'd feel very uh, dubious about getting in a car that was cloud controlled and uh, not knowing how the software is written or how it could be accessed. And that would be, for me, a very scary thing. So. Okay. Yes, isn't so there are always these perceptions and everyone will see something different on those and what they were going to do. I suppose with privacy, it's really how much information you want to share on those. So that's what privacy is about, is you know what information you'll make available and what you don't. And I suppose with the cars on those, this hasn't been decided, but maybe with the cars, it'll just say, well, it's a car. And maybe it might give information as to its destination of where it's going to on those. Um, because with the, uh, the networking, though, they're talking about things like identifying things like school buses, trucks, ambulances, police cars, you know, um, when you've got a car driving down the road, it's, it's not just a car, it could be anything, you know, it could be one of these different types. And those, so that's where the networking also helps on those in um, identifying what type of car and on those you would uh, treat a truck differently than if you were passing a motorcycle or, or a, a sports car or something or other like that. And then a police car would be treated differently again. Um, so that's where the networking that comes in and also making decisions as to um, like the car in front of you may be able to change, might be about to change lanes on those. So it might, it might uh, let the other cars know that it is about to change lanes. So the networking there so that another car doesn't try and move into the same lane at the same time. But with privacy issue, I'm not quite sure what sort of, how much private information would be released. more about uh, you know all the all the vehicles are interacting through the cloud okay. and uh, communicating and or receiving commands through the cloud okay uh, as in you know change lanes brake uh, indicators uh, interacting with other vehicles 
Um, you know, if, if that system is compromised, then you could have all sorts of people playing around with signals and, you know, making a whole bunch of cars turn left into each other or, you know, possibilities are well, which is we've gone back to the, um, the statement of the autonomous vehicle. You know, the vehicle must be able to make its own decisions on those. It must have enough intelligence to be able to avoid accidents and collisions on those and to make its own decisions. And I feel that the networking would really only be there or indicating what other cars are around it. Um, maybe information from traffic lights may come through as well. So the car might stop because it thinks there's a red light ahead. Is someone, yeah, or someone's boofs ahead or go through a green light. So there we are, there's a safety issue. Um, but the car must work autonomously and then it then communicates with other cars around it just to know um, what's happening in the area. I, I would say from, from thinking about privacy, that the, the first issue you suffer in an autonomous car that is networked is simply the fact that you can identify that it's there. If, if on the road cars can know that there is another car, whether it be the fact that it is a normal car, the fact that it's a police car, etc., that inherently gives you some information about its location. We, we've already seen in some situations um, municipalities in the US um, able to track people simply by having a series of um, wireless access points around and they can watch when your phones go past. A similar thing is entirely possible with cars without the autonomy, the autonomy being there, simply the fact that they are connected. Going to the extreme case we saw earlier of the intersection where all the cars are going through and making decisions about whether they can or can't get through without lights. That, that inherently requires there to be some system governing who chooses to go when. If all the cars are purely autonomous, then every car is trusting every other car to make a compatible decision. Now, you can't truly trust every other car to make a compatible decision because who knows who wrote the software in that car. So either A, you write the software for all the cars, in which case everybody's car has to run the same software, and you can imagine how unlikely that is. Or B, there has to be some central authority somewhere that's giving the decisions as to who goes through when, which it goes back to a, a cloud system where somebody knows where everybody is at all times. Going, <laughs> go, going back to the question about um, security of cars. We've already seen, again, with yeah. autonomous cars, issues surrounding connected cars and the security of them. Hmm. Uh, there was a study in the last, I believe, the last 12 to 18 months um, where it was proven that a large range of around several hundred thousand uh, Fords in the US were vulnerable to a remote exploit where a hacker could, with simple devices, effectively a mobile phone and some computers, um, could remotely find, take over and control a car to the point where they could um, turn on your lights, turn on your wipers, turn your music up and prevent it from changing volume or station. They were able to, um, if your car was traveling at low speed, which is kind of the thing you would do if your car suddenly makes blaring noises and the lights start flashing, you might slow down. When it slows down, you get control of the steering wheel, you get control of the brakes, those kinds of things are already seen even without autonomous vehicles. And you can imagine, as soon as you have an autonomous vehicle, yes, it, it, it has some AI in it, that's the autonomy part. But no more is it a, no more is it a secure system than any other uh, computer you stick in a car. And so there are issues surrounding that. Now, the, the case in the, in the US with the Ford cars was fixed. Um, the people who discovered it were nice enough not to hand out the code until it was fixed. Um, and it's certainly a case, I think, that most manufacturers and regulatory bodies are moving towards a greater deal of scrutiny over the security in our cars because they are quite a dangerous thing. And historically, car manufacturers haven't been the most tech savvy of companies in the world. But I, I would say certainly going forwards, there's going to be a high degree of risk, but probably also a high degree of understanding that there needs to be systems in place to, to protect against this kind of stuff. One way to avoid all these problems is to get away from cars altogether. Mm -hmm. the, the Chinese have built a, an autonomous helicopter 
It sells for about $300,000, I think. And um, you call it up and it comes and lands and picks you up and it, uh, you've got a, um, a pad in front of you that you can watch your movies on while it takes off and flies right. you and lands you. One of, one of the problems with it is it doesn't have any collision avoidance systems. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. I suppose it's flying through the sky. If it comes across another one, it could possibly collide <laughs> with it as well. But uh, that sounds like a, a very a good idea of transport. The, the sky is so big on those that we can fit far more vehicles in the sky than we can on the ground. <laughs> I can see an advantage already. Apologies yes. if I missed this in the presentation. Um, I was speaking to somebody from... Um, they're kind of like a, a, a government advisory sort of role. And they're actually getting quite excited about autonomous vehicles from an, like a philosophical ethical perspective mm -hmm. where cars might actually be programmed to actually maybe even sacrifice the occupant of their car if they know that it could save, say, a busload of children. <laughs> oh, okay. And that's the way vehicles might be designed. This to is interesting, road yes. Things like that. Have you come across anything when you were doing your research for this? Did you come across anybody having those kinds of discussions or anything more to share on that one? Well, no, I didn't actually. <laughs> no, it is. It's a philosophical dis dis discussion and an, and an important issue, isn't it? I suppose if an autonomous car, um, which has the intelligence built within it, is knows that it's going to be in an accident on those, what does it decide it's going to do? Yeah, that's certainly something I've seen some research about. <laughs> oh, yes. That's certainly something I've seen about when they, when they discuss what the regulation will be is around do they, does there need to be regulation that says in the situation that you are able to sacrifice a busload of kids versus your occupants, what does the car have to do from a legis legislative point of view? Or should we even be legislating that? Can we, can we trust the people designing the car and the people legislating to put in place a sensible system or a system that can even detect that. Oh. Is an AI car capable of determining, hey, that, actually, that school bus that's full of school children is actually parked and empty, as opposed to it's parked and full of kids? Which do you sacrifice then? The school bus that is parked and full of kids that may not be full of kids or your occupant? Very true. So these are some decisions that actually drivers have to make now. I mean, because actually, if that wasn't an autonomous car, that driver would be in that position. So uh, yes, it is. It's a philosophical issue, and you know, drivers have to make these decisions, and maybe a car might have to make the decision at some stage. There's already a, a built-in bias with driven cars because the driver will always act to put in the instant to protect himself. Yes, yes, it is. And we have we have our self-preservation in, instinct on those built within ourselves. So would the artificial intelligence mim mimic that? You know, so as I say, in this legislation, uh, we'll have to see the technology technology uh, mature, you know, before they can even start to think about this legislation. Well, they can think about it, but uh, they can't enact it on those until it really matures. Uh, and also, you are talking about the helicopter on those, the Chinese one. Well, Elon Musk is going to build one as well. So, uh, yes, he had a, a YouTube video out oh, a couple of weeks ago saying that uh, they were looking at um, vertical takeoff aeroplanes or something or well he's got a rocket takes off vertically and lands <laughs> but uh, yeah he's also interested in uh, that, that form of transport as well sure uh, speaking of Elon Musk do you do you know what happened to his uh, his idea for the tube transport uh, it was came up a couple of years ago sounded really great but no, I haven't heard any more about it either on those. So no, I don't know what happened with that idea on those. Um, I think like anything, like that's a bit like um, the high speed, you know, the high speed rail between Melbourne and, and Brisbane. You know, it's a great idea, but uh, can be expensive and getting it implement, implemented is, uh, is the difficult part. So the technology you're, you're referring to is, is Hyperloop. Um, there's currently, um, Elon Musk as an entity has no current company involved in it. He has money staked in it. Um, I believe there's some kind of foundation around it. Um, there's two current companies in the US which are competing for funds from him. And recently there was, in the last 12 months, I believe, um, there was some kind of achievement in the world of Hyperloop. Um, 
can't remember if it's mistaken me what that actually was. I don't believe they actually managed to get one to work. Um, but I believe there was some funding released and they decided that they were really happy that it was progressing or something. I think it is happening. <laughs> Who knows where it will go. Okay, any more questions on those? We're even getting ready to wind up. Is there one more? Be okay. Okay. Well, that's an interesting topic, isn't it? There's quite a change in that for vehicles on those when um, we're looking at autonomous. Uh, I mean, I'm interested in technology, and we can see that the technology is coming along on those and that we're seeing doing it. I mean, um, autonomous vehicles, the military is interested in it. So that's another whole issue in that in itself. And then we've got agriculture and other industry, as we're saying, that are looking at autonomous vehicles on those that would. Okay. You like that uh, the lidar, the the laser radar on those. You know that's been, that's a mature technology. It's been available for four or five years on those, and they use them on aircraft on those for you know for position location and as you were saying, um, surveying and um, and uh, mining industry. So uh, so what was this seeing coming into cars and that a lot of this technology is actually coming from other areas. So quite often the case, something will be adapted from somewhere else and that and put into it. Um, as well as special things that have to be developed for the cars. So it's interesting times, and those we may see some changes and that come through and that in the years ahead. Oh, well, thank you all for coming on those tonight. And um, we'd, uh, we, we're going to have any supper, you think? Are we sure we use the. Yeah, we will. <laughs> We've got some Tim Tams there and those. So we might go into the uh, tea room and that it's, it's next door, is it? It's on this level? Yeah, it's just here, just here next door. Thank you.